one quick note. I haven't, I didn't have time to update all of my Condor slides, so many of them have been updated, but a couple haven't been. I just didn't have time. Um, so, for example, this data only goes up to 2008, so this doesn't go up in the last couple years, but the trends are, are generally consistent. So, in this case, what I'm showing you is California, Arizona, and then Baja. So, these are the, the, the three areas. We have a couple areas within California, but these are the different regions where we're introducing condors. We're just now beginning to uh, work on introducing them into Oregon, but that's still that's in the works still. So if we look up on, on California, in the lower left, you see that we had some guys out in the wild, and then we were capturing those individuals, bringing them into captivity, and they were being removed. And so we got the last one in 1987. And then there's several years there where we're working on the captive breeding, trying to get the individuals from a, an egg to a chick, from a chick to a fledgling, et cetera. And then uh, the growth has been more or less pretty, pretty even uh, since we started. What you're seeing here is the um, uh, individuals that uh, are uh, hanging out near the nests, individuals that have been um, out of the nest and are starting to fly around, and individuals that have completely left mom or dad's nest or, or rearing uh, facility or the rearing facility and are out flying around and establishing their own uh, nests, mating with individuals, et cetera, if they're uh, older than six years old. And what we see is California has the largest um, population uh, and, and has had the longest population, but Arizona came on really quickly. Look how quickly Arizona, boom, they're coming on in right on our tail. Um, great potential habitat out there is what this is telling us, right? Great potential food source for these guys. Um, relatively isolated from human disturbance in a lot of their area, national park, et cetera, so that's really good. And then Baja most recently has started to come on and uh, but having a much slower uh, growth rate there. So these numbers are accurate. So I did update this um, with the most accurate data last night. So this says up until 2015, that the, it usually takes them about a year or so to release the, the finalized numbers. So I usually report July 1 data. And um, uh, this is as of 2015. So the most recent data point here is 268 individuals in the wild. This isn't including the captivity. This is just folks, uh, just guys out in um, one of our released areas. But 268, that's awesome. That is awesome. So stare at that for a second. And remember that in the 1970s, people were arguing about what we should do. And people were wondering if it was worth the potential risk. And truth be told, we never know how these things completely are going to unfold, right? Bad things could have happened. We could have had some ill luck. We could have had some poor timing of this and that. And uh, things might not have gone the way we had hoped that they would. But they didn't. They went the way we thought they probably, they hopefully would. And we've seen um, fantastic recovery. Now, have a note: um, there's there are pretty steady increase, boop, 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 up until um, about uh, right here in 2012, and then we see a little bit of a dip, a little bit of a dip. So we'll come back to that in a second. But but um, uh, problematic, not ideal, but we're back on course for the the long term uh, growth. Uh, these numbers are, this number's correct, this number's correct, this number's correct, this number's correct here, 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 here. I can't find the most recent data from 2015 for the zoo. So this is, this is older data. So these numbers here are not, not updated. Um, but in general, overall, including the wild and captive, we have 435 individuals alive that descended from those 27 uh, birds. So we still have the issue of potential genetic bottlenecking and relatively constricted uh, a genetic complement to this species. But we seem to be doing okay so far, at least, right? So that's great. So we've, we've essentially farmed, if you will, 16 times the amount of individuals that we had in the late 80s. So that's on the right trajectory. It would be great if we could be recovering them even faster, but this is seeming like we're on the right track. And now, the majority of the population is in the wild. 
as opposed to in one of one or more of our zoos. That's also a great milestone. Very cool. So the last thing in terms of the management plan is um, when when do we say we're done? Right. So we, I just said that we have uh, uh, somewhere. Well, there's probably more of this now because this data is from um, 2015. But but there's more than 435 living birds out there. In the wild, there's more than 268 birds out there. So is that enough? Are we good to go? Do we stop? When, when do we know if we've gone far enough? So we, we refer to that as recovered, or in the, in the parlance of the Endangered Species Act, downlisting from endangered to threatened, or if we take them completely off the list, delisting. So when do we know, well, well, when's, the, when's the, 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 the trigger time that we know that we can um, say we've done a good job? So this definition that I'm using is from the 1996 revision to the Condor Management Plan, Recovery Plan. And, and that is if we have two non-captive and one captive wild population that are self-sustaining. What is self-sustaining? Each of those populations, so each of non-captive, so wild population one, wild population two, and the captive population, each have to have at least 150 birds in them. There are also, of those 150 birds, at least 15, at least 30 of those have to be paired. So I have to have at least 15 bre actively breeding pairs. And we have to have their trajectory looking like, each, each trajectory looking like this. Each trajectory on the way up, so positive growth. Um, in addition, these wild populations, these at least two non-captive populations in the parlance of the recovery plan, they have to be spatially, spatially separated and non-interacting. So as I mentioned, our central California population and our southern California, our, our Santa Barbara Ventura County population, birds, we, we've now proven that birds go in between these populations, right? This recovery says these guys have to be non-interacting. Why might we want them to be non-interacting? I thought we wanted them to be connected. And the, the spread of disease. Right. So for potential um, uh, avian influenza or something like that, that if one population caught it, we want it to be contained to that bad, that, that one spot. So it's a, it's a tough call. We, we like the connectivity for the genetic diversity side of things, but as far as um, primarily we're talking about disease concerns, we're a little bit nervous about uh, contagion being able to go from one population to another. Um, and then one last thing, each of these wild populations has to have at least one descendant from each of the founding bird uh, the, the birds when we started the breeding population with. So we want to have that, even though we have limited genetic diversity, we want to maximize the amount of genetic diversity we have in each of those areas. So we don't want to have one population made up of just the genes from two birds, let's say. Okay? So we're, we're getting, we're starting off, we're getting close. We're, we're, we're heading towards that. We're on a good trajectory for this, but we're not there yet. Some of the other positive signs so for example, in 2006, we saw these females, this one female and this male, um, nest in Monterey County, in this case in this burned out redwood tree. That was the first time we had a nest in Northern California in over a century. So there's all these milestones we keep crossing now. Hey, first time we had a baby here, first time we had breeding pairs here, et cetera. So those are all positive things, and those are all worthy of a newspaper story and worthy of discussing and, and celebrating. Uh, in 2009, we had the first Mexican condor, um, the first condor in Mexico since the 1930s, which is awesome. So this, we had this chick here, and this is in June, um, super cool. So we clearly are on the right path, but just for completeness, let's make sure that we understand that captive breeding has significant challenges. 
They include uh, problems of getting up and running self-sustaining populations. If we are sitting there making babies, if you and I are making babies and then throwing them outside, mm, is, it can be harder to know if that outside population is really capable of making its own babies, right? So that's a challenge. The methodology for how to do this is also problematic for things like condors and necessitated the invention of these, you know, puppets, hand puppets and hiding people and all that kind of jazz. Um, always you have to be willing to replace the methods, right? So, okay, we did this for 10 years, but oh my God, we figured out something else would work even better. Okay, let's, let's change the way the pen is set up. Let's change the this and that. And let's, let's uh, constantly be taking the most successful innovations into account when we're trying to reintroduce these critters. Associated with that is, all, is always the worry of domestication or imprinting, where they get too accustomed to people and they, they might, if they saw a person, and if, if so if we were hand feeding this bird and, and uh, they got to associate humans with food and there were some hunters out hunting, maybe the bird saw them, it would fly down and go, hey dude, you have some food? Make them easy prey, for example, for someone that would want to shoot them. Uh, disease is always a problem. We've talked about it various times, establishing some um, uh, amphibian and, and or reptile breeding facilities here out in Camp Park for some endangered critters we have. And the worry there is always how are you going to make sure that there's not going to be a fungal outbreak or a disease outbreak that you then release, as you release them out in the wild, you unintentionally bring that disease vector out of the wild population. So making sure these guys are disease free is really, really important and infection free, really, really important. Of course, this stuff is expensive. Resources are expensive. And this, everybody wants to give money for the condor release pen. Nobody wants to give you money for cleaning up the condor poop, right? Everybody wants to give you money to open a new wing in the museum. Nobody wants to give you money to pay for the janitors to clean the windows on a Thursday in January, right? That's just not sexy. It's not, not interesting. But nevertheless, it's these long-term investments, the day in, the day out um, goings on uh, that make these projects successful. And almost all, I know of no captive breeding program that works without volunteers. So we, I just had the students, uh, let's see, Greg was with us, anybody else? No, Greg uh, was with us in Hawaii. And uh, there we're looking at monk seal. Uh, one of the stops we looked at was a monk seal recovery, right? All volunteers, all the guys that are getting up at seven in the morning and, and, and making food for these babies and these juveniles, all volunteers. And that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough calling, right? That, those are passionate people, committed people that, um, and, and you need those folks. Then there's a the whole issue of bureaucratic continuity. This is a decadal long recovery trajectory we're on, right? You have to have the policies in place that will at least have a decent level of assurance that this program will continue on from political storm to political storm, right? From change of administrations, from change in, in in uh, telecommunication styles and all these other things, right? Is this program gonna persist? And so you need that. Then another aspect we'll talk about more in a second is this notion of, is the environment stable? Oftentimes, when we've harmed a population, the population has a hard time, uh, you know, um, continuing itself and is beginning to decline, a lot of times that's because there's greater forces at work beyond just the dynamics of that one particular species. So if the environment is degrading around the critter, we pull the critter into captivity, make more of those critters, and then we go put them back out in the wild, but the environment has gotten even worse, how, do you, how does that work, right? Classic example of this would be a lot of our large predators like tigers. It's very likely that we'll have very few tigers out in the wild by the time you guys are older, older Americans. So are, 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 we, are we okay with doing a captive breeding program where, these, where many of these organisms, or, or a large fraction of them, if not the majority, will be living in captivity for as long as we can see? 
real questions you have to struggle with before you really get into the captive breeding um, response. And understand that as you, as you go on, you have to deal with these things continuously. All right, so we saw that little blip, so a little, little drop in condor abundance. This is, the, this is a, some data from 1992 to 2012, and this is source of condor deaths. And this is a, of 123 birds that were examined. And the, the cause of the death is on the x-axis. And the gray bars represent birds from California, the blue birds from Arizona, and the um, uh, orange ones from Baja. So what, what, what pattern do you note there in terms of how condors are dying? What's that? Lead appears to be a big one. What else? Most of them are dying in California. Uh, right, right. That's because California has the largest population, but, but sure. Right, yeah, so good. Are the causes of death consistent, um, at least relatively consistent, amongst uh, different areas? There's a higher concentration of deaths from lead in Arizona than California. Right. So California is a larger population, but Arizona has more birds outright dying from lead poisoning. Baja, it's fairly evenly distributed, right? Uh, Baja, there's some guys choking on trash, some guys being killed by predators, and a few guys dying from lead, right? R roughly pretty similar. And, and, and all the other causes of death are roughly pretty similar. Whereas in Arizona, lead mortality is driving the story. Should also note that this is, these are critters that died. There's a ton of these critters impacted by lead that we had to take into captivity and give them treatment. Otherwise, they absolutely would have died. Yeah. I did have a little side note about the power line. Uh, the vet at the, well, she was a vet a long time ago, and at the LA Zoo was part of the rehabilitation of these guys. Um, and she gave us like a presentation at Moore Park, and um, she said that when they were um, when they were in captivity before they would let them out, once they started realizing that they were dying from landing on power lines, that they would put power line like fake ones into the enclosures with them. And then whenever they land on them, there'd be some kind of, I don't, I don't remember what it was, but negative Disincentive. Stimulus, uh -huh. stimulus, yeah. So they trained them to not land on them, basically, before they would release them. Cool. Which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, that's good. Power lines are definitely something we can address, right? That, that, that's a relatively consistent threat. Um, we, we can manage that. We can, you know, no power line company wants to kill condors, right? So we can figure out some approaches. Maybe it's, maybe it's putting flagging tape on it, you know, whatever it is. We could figure out some approaches that would address the problem. Other ones here are not really necessarily in our power to easily manipulate. Fire return frequency, that's kind of hard. Micro trash, microplastics, that's a ubiquitous problem across the planet. It it's, would be a tall task. I think we can affect the amount of microplastics just in the condors area, et cetera. Lead, et cetera. So some of these things are relatively easy to manage or at least won't be a, a massively increasing threat. Others are very difficult to manage and other things potentially could be a growing threat to these guys. So in general, uh, as of 2013, about one out of five of our wild condors have lead levels in their blood high enough to require some type of intervention. And uh, pretty much starting around 2013, lead is, is increasingly the, uh, the, the big killer of these guys. So more than half of these individuals that die are dying because of lead toxicity. So here's some data from some Big Sur populations. 
and this is uh, the amount of lead in their blood. So here we go. Here are the months, January, February, March, April, May, June, etc. This is how many birds we sampled. This is the mean uh, concentration of lead in their um, blood. And this is the lowest level we saw in that group of birds. And this is the highest level. So this is the range, 4 to 5. Four, excuse me, 4 to 15 with an average of 6 and a standard deviation of 6.1. So I'll just know that the detection limit for lead in blood with these units is three. And uh, yeah, I'll just say that. And, and, and when we get up to about 60 or so units, we start to see clinical effects. And if we see higher than 100, that's usually pretty much gonna die pretty quick levels of poisoning, right? So 60 and above would be developmental impacts, um, that kind of stuff, chronic impacts. When you get to 100, they're pretty much going to die pretty quick. So what do you see here? Is there, is, there a, is there any pattern you guys can see to when stuff is happening? What, when blood is getting more lead rich? Hunting season, right. Hunting season. And, and so one, hunting season, two, is when we tend to see these spikes, but then two, we have some birds that have almost twice the, the, tox, the, the, the acute toxicity <laughs> level. So some of these birds are getting a lot of lead. A lot of lead. Real quick, a little, little history about lead. Um, we've been using lead in our society for a long time. Lead is uh, a malleable, you know, a mushable and easily changeable metal. So it's been very popular for a long time. Um, for example, we have evidence that we've used lead specifically as fishing weights around nets or at the bottoms of nets since at least the Bronze Age. Lead also has a relatively low melting point, so it's relatively easy to pour into, into mold into different shapes. Um, heavily used extensively uh, for the first time, at least in the Western world, in Roman and Egyptian um, cultures where it was used all over the place, especially for piping um, and uh, in pots. There's a lot of leaded pots. Um, and some people have speculated this is one of the key reasons why the Roman Empire fell. There's actually many other reasons, but, but probably at least a contributing factor that as everybody got on these water systems, they were getting more and more exposed to lead. And so you saw, we see developmental problems as we're seeing with Ferguson now, with the lead problem in the water in Ferguson. Um, and, and uh, you know, ch more difficult behavior of children in classes and all those kinds of things. We first started using lead as uh, something to shoot into an, an organism or an individual. Um, when we first invented gunpowder, we liked it. Um, we like lead because lead deforms. So the idea is, when you shoot at something, you want to kill that thing. You want to have a big impact. And we could just throw a rock, and that rock would you know, hit my arm and go through my arm. Or maybe hit my chest and come out the other side, of, come out my back, right? which would be bad. But to cause even more damage, what, we'd like to, what you might want to have happen is shoot that bullet. When it hits my chest, it mushes out like a mushroom. It's, it, it flattens out or it, it, it fractures. So it, instead of just coming out as a... You know, it's a one-inch hole going in and a one-inch hole coming out the back. It might go in as a one-inch hole and come out as a two- or three-inch hole, right? So it cause more damage. So that's why we like lead. It's cheap, first and foremost, easy to manipulate. And two, it's relatively effective at causing a lot of damage when we um, uh, are throwing a projectile at something. Uh, we've known about this toxicity for people for quite some time now. Um, we've seen all kinds of developmental neurological toxicity associated with lead to the point that lead, the, the Centers for Disease Control, considers lead to be not safe at any level. So even the lowest low, low, low concentrations of lead are considered bad. And that led to um, a, a big push to change how we uh, allow lead in our society. So we see the a first big ban on paints in 1977. This is especially directed at uh, 
uh, we see significant advances here, particularly in low income areas and poor areas where people have maybe not the resources to do a lot of maintenance in their house and they had a lot of old paint, that paint would flake off. A lot of children would ingest these paint chips. And we saw a lot of issues related to mental um, uh, development prob developmental problems, et cetera, based on people ingesting lead paints, especially in old urban cores. And uh, so the ban on lead-based paints went into effect in 1977. Uh, and then we complete that with the phase out of gasoline. So another success story. You hear about Ferguson and you might think that we have a lot of problems to overcome. We still have problems to overcome. But the amount of lead in our environment, our ambient environment, has been going down since the 1970s. That's great. We used to put lead into, anybody know why we put lead into gas? It was an additive. You know why we put it in? It helped with so-called knocking of the engine. So it didn't necessarily make the engine work a whole lot better, but it made it sound a lot, a lot better. and gave it a little thing a bit more power. So we added all this lead and we combusted all this lead and threw it out in the atmosphere, primarily so that we could have something that was a bit more aesthetically pleasing. Yeah? They still use a lot of uh, lead and gasoline for uh, like high performance race cars. So they still use that. Uh... Right, right. But it's, it's a small fraction of what we used yeah. to use. And they, and they have to, they add it in. Right, yeah, it's, a, so it's, a spe it's like a performance booster kind of thing, right? So nowhere near the amount of emissions that were coming out when every single, or almost every single tailpipe in the country was pumping the stuff out. And because we've changed the engine designs to not need lead gasoline, now folks in Argentina or wherever that buy their, ga their, their cars, they don't need lead gasoline either. So we've actually helped eliminate lead gasoline from across the planet by, by changing its, uh, the, the, its use in the U.S. That's the same philosophy with California's climate change legislation, et cetera, is that we're changing stuff here, and we have emission stuff. Because we have such a large market, as we go, the rest of the U.S. goes, and as the rest of the U.S. goes, uh, so goes the theory, um, a lot of the world will follow in suit. Um, okay, so then uh, we, we saw the first bans on leaded ammunition for hunting in 1991. This was specifically for waterfowl. Not allowed to use it um, across the US. And then we saw a ban on lead soldering in our food cans in 1995. Um, we first, and so this ban of lead shot in waterfowl was the growing realization that lead doesn't just harm humans, harms other things as well. And so we talk about the toxicity, uh, toxicology is usually, is traditionally the study of poisons in people. Ecotoxicology is the study of poisons in things outside of humans. So other animals, ecosystems, etc. So ecotoxicology, so we can talk about lead ecotoxicology. And we've, we're, we're still really fully understanding the physiological effects in many systems um, uh, we're still learning how to do that these days because we've, we've had most of our focus on humans. But we have known for some time, such as some work, uh, some observations in Texas and North Carolina in, you know, over 120 years ago, 130 years ago, that um, these guys were, were, that the lead was causing toxicity to birds. And then this important study came out in um, the end of the 50s uh, that, that helped further this understanding and link. And um, we saw a lot of endangered bald eagles secondarily poisoned in the 70s and 80s, and that really helped move us forward, again, leading to the phase out of leaded shot for waterfowl hunting in the US in 1991. This is the story in California. Here is that, here is that distribution. I remember, remember I told you the, the, the horseshoe shaped distribution of where condors are foraging. Here are major US military bases um, surrounding that area. So we have a lot of potential sources. The military obviously use guns a lot and they need to practice so they know how to properly use those guns. So they have a lot of firing ranges and they have a lot, and what that was. So one, we have a lot of um, firing ranges and then two, we have a lot of uh, places where people are out walking across the landscape <coughs> shooting lead. Some of our areas like out here at Magoo Lagoon where we have a, a test range, of, a firing range, we have mineable concentrations of lead in the soil there because we've shot, we've 
thrown so many bullets into this defined area over uh, such a long period of time. Right here, we're talking about animal shot, and, and this is in 2000. And so this is the distribution. So this is other. Red is rabbits and tree squirrels. So mostly eastern fox squirrels and gray squirrels. Uh, coyote is green. Uh, wild boar or pig is uh, pink. And then blue is deer. So we see is um, we're shooting a lot of things that aren't necessarily um, the, the core condor prey, but we're shooting a wide variety of prey items in this area that is condor territory. Uh, in 2000, we shot 91,000 animals in this, in this region. Uh, and for, especially for the bigger things, for a squirrel, maybe not so much, a rabbit, maybe not so much, but for the bigger things, for the boar, for the deer, these are big bodied individuals and um, it, they're, so they're, just, they're just big, right? And so if you shoot one, do you want to carry the whole weight of that sucker out with you? Probably not. You're probably going to gut it. So leave the entrails, etc., there, and then just take the skin and the meat out with you. So it's a lot easier to carry, a lot lighter to carry. So that means that people traditionally just leave this stuff out there. And if we were using lead bullets, which most people have used, now we have these, this prey item or potential forage item full of little flecks of lead. So perfect way to potentially poison things like condors. And that's what we see. So when we take these guys and we do x-rays a lot of times, especially the ones that have high lead concentration in their bloods. Blood, so we're doing, so we're looking, so here's a bird. He's been anesthetized to take an x-ray of him. Here's his body. Here's a condor. Here's his body. Here's one wing. Here's another wing. And this is a big chunk of lead in his digestive tract. So we swallow this big piece of lead and his digestive enzymes are basically working to, to put that lead up into his digestive fluids and then therefore it pass the um, intestinal barrier and go into his bloodstream. This is a survey of hunters in Arizona, which remember we said Arizona was the place with the highest concentration of, of, uh, of uh, deaths from lead uh, relative to other mortality sources for condors. So this is a survey we did of hunters. So, so the guy said, hey, here you go. Uh, we'll give you some alternative munitions that don't use lead, do the same thing. And then they went back and they surveyed folks. They said, hey, so when you shot this, you know, say it's say a shooting range, they gave them some, some alternative bullets, shot them, and they said, hey, did these bullets work as well as the lead bullets? Um, most of the people said they worked better than the leaded bullets. They, they flew truer, they were more, more likely to go where they were aiming to. Um, because they weren't as distendable and as malleable as uh, as the lead uh, alternatives were. Are they a lot cheaper? No, they're not cheaper. So that's part of the deal. So we'll talk about that in one second. Hold that, hold that thought. But they're not cheaper. So most people said they would use it, especially if initially we had a free exchange. So initially we went up to hunters and we said, hey, you're hunting? Here you go. Give me your lead bullets. I'm going to give you these alternative ones for free on a one-to-one -one swap. People are like, okay, we'll do that. Uh, they and so the price has been coming down. I don't know, has anybody bought munitions lately? I don't typically buy. So so how how much more is the non lead? I don't know. I just didn't look. Right. Well, it increased. I think it was like like forty to fifty percent in price. Right. Yeah. So 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 last time I checked, it was about it was about forty percent more for the non lead alternatives. But as we're using it more and more, that price is coming down. I, I just don't know how quickly it's, it's coming down. Um, one of the main funders of research into alternative bullet alloys is the US Department of Defense. Again, because as we mentioned, they have so many shooting ranges around, they're actually finding groundwater contamination under some of their shooting ranges that they have to pay for and do all this kind of stuff. So they actually um, are, are, are one of the leaders in funding research to find alternative alloys that uh, have the performance characteristics that people want, but yet won't, won't have the uh, toxicity um, associated with them. Uh, okay, um, but yeah, so, but, but last time I checked, it is about 40% more uh, per, per bullet. Um, 
and then and then when they asked other, they said, "Hey, would you recommend this lead alternative bullet to your your buds that are hunters?" And most of them said they would, right? So three quarters of them said, "Yeah, this 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 was seems to work better, more accurate, blah blah blah." I think I think we should maybe use this. Um, and they use this survey to actually it's I think this has been stopped now, but initially to to fund these non lead coupons that you could get especially in condor areas, not the whole state, but in condor uh, residing areas, where you go and, and exchange that coupon uh, and a lead bullet for alternatives. And this also helped foster um, the notion that, hey, this, the, this alternative actually does work, so maybe we should actually go ahead with bans, outright bans on leaded munitions. And that's what we saw here with the Ridley Tree Condor Preservation Act. Um, and a uh, lot of pushback on this. This is a state, California state law. A lot of pushback on this from the National Rifle Association and, and uh, well, most from the National Rifle Association. Um, but uh, a lot of craziness was being said. Things like, we don't know where the condors are getting their lead poisoning. You know, there's a lot of lead pollution that comes out of cars. Not really. And so, uh, you know, we think maybe some of these birds might be eating weeds by the side of the road. That was the craziest argument I heard. That weeds by the side of the road, that's what's coming. I mean, come on. You know, we, we, could, we could talk about what the right of solution is, but to go down the rabbit hole of just la-la land um, doesn't seem to be appropriate. Um, so needless to say, that, that, that did not, th th those anti, um, uh, those, those pro-lead munition arguments didn't really hold uh, wait, I couldn't find a good excerpt specifically talking about lead uh, litigation and lead legislation. But suffice it to say, uh, we don't know what our current, what our incoming administration is going to do on things like lead. But uh, all the indications I've seen are uh, folks not particularly interested in doing things like alternative lead munition bans. Um, it is a challenge when we have the new, well, the likely to be new head of our agencies that are supposed to be working on, from facts to not uh, understand facts, I guess, is very uh, disheartening, unfortunately. Um, but particularly um, when we have something we know actually works. So um, we saw that blip there, right? Remember we saw that blip in the population Guys, going down, we've been seeing increasing amounts of lead exposure. But in the wake of this uh, legislature, this, this is our California policy now, um, we've actually seen some improvements. It's taken a while for them to go into effect. So again, even though we passed this uh, law a little while ago, um, we, it didn't go into effect fully until last year, which was uh, banning uh, non-lead ammunition in essentially areas where the um, state controls, state reserves, and, and, and wildlife areas. The next phase went into effect this year, which said that um, we're not allowed to use uh, lead-based ammunition uh, anytime we're hiding, hunting birds or anytime we're using shotguns. And the final phase will come into play in 2019, which is no hunting at all with lead ammunition will be permitted in the state of California. Right? So if done properly, and taking, you know, we don't want hunters not to hunt. We, we, we're not, that, that's not the goal. This, the goal is to, to make things safer for, for everyone. And, uh, and if you do it appropriately, I think we can have reasoned um, uh, regulations to promote the recovery of endangered species. If we deny facts, it's very difficult to have an adult conversation with someone that just puts their finger in their ears and screams, you know, scooby-gooby, scooby-dooby-doo all the time. But, um, but that's, that's the state. So, so we know this, this approach is, seems, does, is, potentially can work, and if we expand this to other areas, this may well continue the recovery of condors. And again, we're getting towards, we're not there yet, but we're getting towards the point where we can remove, begin to delist and, and consider some of these populations recovered. And with that, uh, I'll just leave you with a picture of one of my son's favorite, uh, when he was a kid, favorite uh, books, which is this children's book about the condor. Right? So we've started off this discussion talking about how iconic this character is, this, this 
this uh, important member of our ecosystems here, important scavenger, dropped out of really effective ecological presence because of endangerment. But now we see the day when we can um, look forward to seeing this critter around and not being poisoned and, and needing chelation therapy to take lead out every single time um, as we go into the future. So uh, I would say the, the uh, future for the condor looks bright if we stay on these hard fought uh, tra trajectories that we're on. And the condor, again, are one of the conservation success stories and you guys should be proud of the work to recover this um, iconic endangered species. Were there any like noticeable effects in the where they normally would be? Like I don't know, because they're not around anymore. Right. Do whatever so the question is, uh, did we see any uh, um, when we removed the last of those condors in nineteen eighty seven, did we see any shifts in the ecosystem? The answer is no because they were already so low in abundance that you know, those changes probably started happening in 1900, 1910, and so just losing a handful, a couple dozen more birds, almost impossible to see that. Um, uh, actually, the reverse is what we would start to see. As, as these populations come back, we might s begin to see improved functioning of these systems. So I didn't, I didn't uh, so normally when I teach this class, I have all these different stories. I, I didn't, did Dr. Claire talk about vultures in general, any, any vulture ecology? So we have an example that I like to talk about is um, um, in India, a couple, like 10 years ago or so, uh, we had a problem, a similar problem we've had around the planet, which is incredibly potent, powerful drugs that are, you can use however you want. So drug, powerful drugs with little restrictions on their use. In this case, this was uh, a drug to, um, that would uh, make livestock um, uh, essentially feel better when they, when they were feeling ill, and especially when they were um, giving birth and stuff. So these guys started buying this drug and giving this di diclofenac, I can't remember what it was, um, to, uh, to all their cows massively overprescribed, massively overprescribed. Then we started seeing, and so in, in India, um, uh, water buffalo cattle are sacred, and so um, people don't necessarily eat beef, right? So um, if we had a sick cow here, we'd maybe take it to the slaughterhouse and, and you know, cook it up into a McBurger or something or whatever, right? Uh, in India, uh, that's not really what happens. So when th these critters um, might be roaming around, they die, they die, scavengers come in and eat them. Well, it turns out this um, substance was just like our second, just like our third generation rodenticides that are causing the problems with our mountain lions um, are persisting in the bodies of these critters. The vulture community comes in lands, which is the community that has traditionally eaten all these dead, these dead cows, and uh, eat, 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 the vultures started dying. Their kidneys basically shut down, and they just di started dying. So we have whole swaths of the Indian subcontinent, especially in certain states, that lost their vultures over the course of a couple years. Sometimes we came in, there'd be hundreds of vultures in this one area one year. Come in the next year, there'd be a couple dozen. And the next year, there'd be like none. And so massive problem with decomposition. Massive, so we started seeing spikes in bubonic plague in India. Started seeing huge outbreaks of all these diseases because rats, the rat population started going ape shit because the, um, the, there were no, the traditional scavenger community weren't serving their ecological role of, de of breaking down these carcasses. And so other critters were filling in the role and those critters were helping spread disease. So. You, in that case, you could tie it directly to human mortality. So the loss of these, this vulture guild was leading to um, huge problems. And again, you think, oh, maybe just scoop it up, take it to the dump. There are cultural taboos about doing that. So, um, so in places like that, you can see a, a clear direct impact. Here in the Southwest, not so much. Um, especially some of these areas, because of the lead, 
we've actually gone in and are augmenting their foods. That one picture I showed, I said it was a baby calf. We've actually gone to some places and started putting out dead, like aborted calves and things uh, that were clean, that weren't killed by hunters, that we put out so we know those guys could feed on that and have a clean source. This is before we had the lead munition ban. ban. So, um, so we've also haven't seen the impacts maybe as widely as we would see because we were, we were for a while augmenting their, their food source with stuff we were bringing in because of the poisoning problem. So having said that, I would predict that if the, if the trajectory continues, if we have the full, if phase three kicks in, we have the full phase out of lead munition for hunting in California, um, we, will, we will almost assuredly see um, increased um, consumption of these um, dead animals by condors, and that's probably a good thing. So I would, I would predict that 10 years, 15, 20 years out, we should see some benefits, even though we haven't really necessarily seen the effect of their disappearance. Cool. Other questions?